I would like to thank you all for joining us here today, Father Gregory Post and me, Father Stanich, here in the great Commonwealth of Kentucky. It's a very special year for us here at our Priory in Walton, 2022. Father Gregory Post will be celebra is celebrating his 50th anniversary to the priesthood, his golden anniversary to the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father Gregory Post was ordained in 1972 by our founder, Archbishop Lefebvre, two years after the founding of our society. And so the purpose of our, our little interview today is to give us a, a little history of Father Post. He is the first American priest ordained in the Society of St. Pius X. And I thought what we would do is we would center those years from the late 50s in his Catholic edu early Catholic education, all the way up until the time he entered the Society of St. Pius X. The late 50s, all the way into the early 70s, are, of course, very interesting years here, and not just in America, but in the world. Uh, obviously, in the Catholic Church, there was uh, a great upheaval after the Second Vatican Council, and so Father Post uh, could tell us a lot of things firsthand, what it was like in those years, uh, especially in the 1960s. So that is uh, the purpose of our conversation today. So for the next 45 minutes, we will learn a little about Father Gregory Post in his early years in his preparation uh, to the priesthood and then finally at his ordination. So let us um, begin this conversation. I will interview Father Post and ask some different questions. And hopefully we can learn a much about not just Father Post, but a lot of the work of the Society of St. Pius X. Can you tell us a little about your um, early education and preparation for the seminary? What were you? What did you do in your high school years in, in uh, San Francisco? Well, I attended a good, solid Catholic school, Holy Name Parish, out in the sort of west central part of San Francisco. This uh, school was taught by the Sisters of Mercy. Sometimes we refer to them as Sisters of No Mercy, but, but they were excellent teachers. I had Sister Mary Carmilla as my eighth grade teacher, and she encouraged my vocation. And we had a couple of very excellent priests there, too, one of whom later on became the Archbishop up in Alaska, Frank Hurley. And so the time came, eighth grade, for us to decide which high school we were going to go to. There were three Catholic high schools in San Francisco, Plus there was the minor seminary, St. Joseph's College in Mountain View, 40 miles southeast of the city. And so I was one of 10 that took the test for the seminary and they accepted, accepted six of us. And I was the only one of the six that made it all the way through the And then I got into the major seminary and that, uh, that's a later story. So you were four years in this minor seminary, about 40 miles uh, uh, southeast of San Francisco. And so, uh, what did your minor seminary uh, education consist in? It was heavily uh, slanted towards English and Latin. You had to do well in those subjects or they let you go. They said you don't have a vocation. So English and Latin were the major, the, the, all the liberal arts courses. We took, starting the third year of high school, we had Greek, New Testament Greek. And of course, history, geography, and religion, of course. Uh, but it was heavily into the classics. Okay. And so you finished your uh, minor seminary uh, when you were 18, 17 years old, and that would have been 1957. And in 1957, obviously, you had to make a further decision about your priesthood. And so where did you go from the minor seminary then? The minor seminary took us up to two years into the college of 1959. And then... <coughs> decide if we're going to continue with that. I continued with the major seminary 10 miles away, St. Patrick's in Mineral Park, which is still there. But after a while in there, I, I decided I really wanted something different. So I, I left them and got into the University of San Francisco, finished off my four years degree, a B, a classical in San Francisco, then I went to Berkeley for a while, San Francisco State, got certified as a high school language teacher, and then this takes us up to 1964. So 
So you began your uh, college, uh, your university um, education at the university in San Francisco. Uh, what year was that again? I began there in, in uh, 60, uh, 60, 60, and then continued through 61, graduated in 61. Okay, so that was two years at the University of San Francisco, and then in 61, when you graduated there, you said you went to the... Uh, university of California in Berkeley, studied linguistics, but it was such a difficult thing because I didn't have a car. I had to take public transportation from San Francisco to Berkeley, which is a long way, and so I switched over to San Francisco State University, and got certified to teach language on the high school level. Okay, and when did you graduate San Francisco State University? I finished there in 1961. No, excuse me, that was 61, this is 63. Okay, 1963. So we're already now, you're 23 years old at this mm -hmm. time, in 1963, and um, like you said, you had been considering the seminary and so now it was uh, a decision for you to make after your graduation at the, the, this last university that you were uh, attending. So what, what was your next step in, in for your preparation in becoming a priest? Well, I did some language teaching in San Francisco at that time, 63. And in that first semester, the terrible thing happened of the John Kennedy assassination that uh, just grabbed everybody. Everything was just so upset. But a few months later, 1964, the Lord gave me the inspiration to try religious orders. So I read to five of them. They all wrote back, and the Discalced Carmelites, the one that St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila and Teresa of the Zoo belong to, invited me to come up to San Francisco, well, north of San Francisco, 60 miles of the wine country. And so I took a trip up there in the, uh, say, July 64, and I liked it very much. They accepted me, so I went into the Discalced Carmelites. So that would, so you would enter the uh, Carmelites in 1964? 64, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically how long would you be now at uh, the Carmelites there north of San Francisco? That was a one-year novitiate. After one year, got tra took vows, went down to their seminary, East San Jose, for the one year of philosophy. That took us up to 66. And then the three provinces of the Carmelites in the United States combined their students because there were only 18 of us total, so they put us all in Washington, D.C. So I was in Washington, D.C., the Carmelite place there. Uh, we had courses in our own place the first year, but the second year, 67, 68, they made us all go to uh, Catholic University about a mile away. Okay. So now you're still with the Carmelites, and now you're in Washington, D.C., and obviously yep. the Second Vatican Council had just ended. So uh, for you, being in Washington, being far away, obviously, from your home, uh, flying across the whole country, what was it like being then in Washington, D.C., going to the Catholic University there, and also uh, living with the Carmelites? What was the life like there? Well, it was okay, but not nearly as good as it had been in California. And gradually, that school year of 67 to 68, they got rid of one tradition after the other. So it became known as kind of a country club. They put a television in the library. There was easy access to go out at night. There was a refrigerator full of beer and other things, easy, easy access to money. And so I just said, I, I didn't become a Carmelite to live like this. So when my vows, expired in 68. I, went, I had gone over to uh, San Francisco to help my family move up to Post Falls, and I just didn't go back. Okay, so um, you, you're saying then that in the, the two years that we were in Washington, obviously you saw a great change in the spirit of the Carmelites. Do you think that is a, a consequence of the Second Vatican Council, or you think this was even happening before that? Oh, it was happening before that. They were going into it. Some of the couple of priests there who had been priests for more than 20 years after a long you know, Carmelite traditional education decided after all this time they had to leave the whole thing and go on and get married, which they did. So, so, it, um, so obviously there was a great um, change in the spirit of the Carmelites. Obviously we know something about the 
Kaos Carmelites, obviously it's a very strict order, so obviously this is not what you expected. It was totally different from what I expected, yeah. Okay, so you left the Carmelites in 1968, obviously uh, a big change in your life, and you're now 28 years old. Um, you know, what, what do you think God was thinking of you then? You said you went back to San Francisco with your family and you were even planning maybe leaving there and moving somewhere else, so take us from there now. Okay, well, at the same time, 68, my family was was my mother, father, and an adopted German sister, um, girl. But they were moving from San Francisco up to the Post Falls, Idaho area to get away from uh, the, the liberal part of California. Plus, there was a, a group forming up there, traditionalists, which didn't turn out too well. But we uh, made contact with quite a few other. The, the group grew to about 20, 30 people. They're close to Post Falls, Idaho. And then uh, one of our prisoners came by the house one day. Hey, there's a traditional mass being set up uh, just a little bit north of there in the city there in, in Idaho. Uh, let's, let's go look at it. So my mother and I went up there the next morning. Father Edward Debeshera, a retired Canadian priest who had been in the Canadian Army in World War II went up there and sure enough he was saying the traditional mass and so he, my mother and I talked to him asking him if he would take over this group now which had gone to about 20 people if he would say mass for us every Sunday and Holy Day of Obligation we would give him a stipend plus pay for his gas and he agreed to that and so they went on for uh, three years before I went to Switzerland. Okay, so that was in Post Falls. Uh, so you met this priest, what was it, 1969? Uh, it, it, yeah, it was pro probably 69, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you had him for uh, just a couple of years then. And when did that officially become a mission then? Or is it, uh, was, not, was it now an official mission with this priest coming in every Sunday? Well, it wasn't with any organization. This is, uh, society didn't take over that place for some time. It was an informal agreement between the priest and us. We would uh, pay his expenses, and he would say mass for us every Sunday and Holy Day of Obligation. So did you play a great part in organizing this group, or were you one of the leaders of this group that brought this priest to uh, Post Falls? Well, I, I guess you could say I was a leader, but the priest really led it. I was the sacristan and altar boy, uh, but that was about it, you know. Okay, so for a, a couple years then you uh, were attending Mass in Post Falls and so obviously you still had an openness maybe to the priesthood and so um, take us now to the next part in, in your life here. Um, obviously you would meet Archbishop Lefebvre soon after that so tell us how you finally would meet Archbishop or even hear about the Archbishop. My mother was in contact all this time with a Professor Robin Anderson, British guy in Rome their mutual interest in Cardinal Mary del Val was what brought them together. Cardinal Mary del Val was a cardinal under St. Pius X. He would be canonized today if we had the right people in the church. Anyway, their mutual interest got them together, and Professor Anderson told my mother, this is 19, probably early 71, the Archbishop of Fever had left the Holy Ghost Fathers because they weren't uh, traditional anymore, He's going to live down there the rest of his life in Rome and write things and meet, meet with people. And my mother had told him I was looking for a traditional seminary. And he said, well, maybe you could get together with Archbishop of the Fever and see what uh, happening now. At the same time, Archbishop of the Fever's seminary was beginning to get going in Switzerland. So it was beautiful timing. Well, I mean, divine providence, of course. So obviously the society started in, in November of 1970, and now you're talking 1971, so finally, uh, in what month did you meet the Archbishop, and where did you meet him? It was November 70, or oh, it must have been by this time, no, even the snow was still on the ground. In February or March of 71, he came to this country to a couple of, uh, oh, excuse me, all the... Holy Ghost houses, he'd been uh, the head of the Holy Ghost Fathers, Pittsburgh and Los Angeles. And so he wrote to me, he's going to be at the Holy Ghost Fathers place in Pittsburgh at, at a certain date, early 71, 
And so I flew out there to meet him. So you flew out to meet the Archbishop in Pittsburgh, who's at, at one of the houses of the Holy Ghost Fathers? Yes, yeah, so the, 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 the uh, one ho house of the Holy Ghost Fathers in Pittsburgh. Yeah, it was a suburb, but it was Pittsburgh. And so what was your first meeting like then with, uh, with Archbishop Lefebvre? I walked in, well, early in the morning. I had called there the previous night, but I said, well, come by in the morning. You know. So I, I came in the morning. It was about 6.30, 7 o'clock. Snow was still on the ground. <coughs> and I said, I hear to see our special of favor. Yeah, he's in there saying mass. <coughs> so I walked in. He was halfway through his mass with no server. So I knelt down and served the second half of his mass. And that's how we met. It was Thanksgiving. We had breakfast. I asked him for a... <coughs> application form for the seminary. He gave it to me, and then we parted. I went back home, sent the application, and he went out to see the bishop there, a bishop in Los Angeles. Okay, so <coughs> you, were, um, you sent the application then to Archbishop of Fava in his seminary at Icon, and finally, when were you accepted it into the seminary? One month later, I got a notice from the society in Icon, the secretary there, Okay, you've been accepted for the 1971 class at Acon. Be over here uh, beginning of the school year, September or so, 71. September 71. <coughs> so 1971 then, you finally had the, um, the great fortune to go to Switzerland. Uh, what was it like then as an American going maybe Europe for the first time? Obviously, your, your French probably wasn't the greatest. Uh, what was it like going to Econ and, um, and seeing the seminary for the first time? Well, it wasn't really a problem with the language because in the train stations and the airports, they, they speak English and French. So I, I, I was told the nearest train station was a free, free, uh, uh, Sion, Switzerland, Sion, S-I-O-N, and so I, out of uh, Geneva, got a train to Sion, about 10 miles east of Econ, and from there called the seminary, <coughs> so uh, I'm here, so you know, I can say that without any big difficulty, so they sent a car, picked me up, got me over to Econ, just in time for lunch that day. <coughs> so that was in uh, September 1971? <coughs> Yes, uh, it was probably they do things. They did things a little later over there. It was September seventy-one. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so you began your uh, seminary, <laughs> with, uh, Archbishop of in the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth. Um, but um, what I've heard in the past from you is that you did not do your studying at Econ. You you did your studying uh, somewhere else. So where did you do your final uh, years. of your education in the seminary? Well, after we finished the retreat which was a real trial for us. Uh, three guys came over from New York, too. We had to sit through a whole week's, uh, a t week of talking uh, in French, and I, I didn't know 10 words of French at the time. But uh, the Archbishop then called me into his office at Econ and said, well, Gregory, I can see by your record you have finished almost all the theology courses, so I'm going to send you up to the University of Freiburg, Switzerland, about 80 miles away. We've already got several seminarians there. And so a car drove me up to Freeburg, <coughs> and a week or two later, I got enrolled and started going to the University of Freeburg. And so what was, um, what was the education that you had to finish then for, for the seminary? What kind of classes were you taking in yeah. Freeburg, and who were your teachers? Well, it was the last two years of theology taught by Dominican priests. A couple of them are quite traditional. I don't remember their names now. But uh, they, they, uh, a couple of them came down once a week to uh, Econ to give classes, but it was traditional, tra traditional theology taught by these two traditional uh, Dominican priests that were French-speaking. Okay, so they gave you your final uh, year or so of education in the seminary. And so, um, but since you were there, how did you have a community life in Freeburg? Uh, you said there were a few seminarians with you. How did you guys keep the, the rule of the seminary? Well, we just uh, made up our minds that, that that's going to be the rule of life for this house, too. It was a real hall of studies. But we did a good job. That we were, uh, after one semester, a couple more Americans joined me, Kelly and Sanborn, I think it was. So we were two, three Americans with four French, 
But we kept the, kept the spirit pretty well. But there, there was, uh, it was there's I, nothing I can say to, to complain about that. We got a good spirit there. So you lived on the seminary at uh, the uh, at the house uh, campus. Uh, no, we we had a separate house uh, about a, a mile away from it. A house of the society, which all the rules of the society were kept there. Okay, so basically. In this house, you would go from there every day to the university. Yes, you walked over. It was almost exactly a mile over to the university. Yeah. So where would you go to mass uh, during this time? I've there, there were many priests saying the traditional mass at the time. How would you go to mass then during this? this uh, five there, year there was a French priest living in the house with us who say mass was every day. Okay, so he did the uh, traditional mass. Oh yes, yeah, so the, the archbishop would not permit anything but the traditional mass, of course. Okay. So that University of Freiburg then would be your final uh, years of study of uh, seminary training, and that would end in uh, when the summer of seventy two. Would that be uh, the uh, time you finish? Seventy two is when I finished the first year there, and the Archbishop, meanwhile, in that school year, uh, ordained me to subdeacon and deacon. So it's now the summer of seventy two. Uh, deacon, uh, he, he surprised very, very much one time. He, he was so trusting. Okay, so before we tell us about the trusting of the Archbishop, when did he make you sub deacon and deacon? Where did he do that in Econ, or did he do that in Freeburg? Where well, did we, the we, consecrate you? We did it down to the Econ. We took trips down to Econ three or four times in the school year there. And the Archbishop, meanwhile, in that school year, uh, ordained me to subdeacon and deacon, so it's now the summer of '72. Uh, deacon, uh, he, he surprised me very much one time. He, he was so trusting. Okay, so before we tell us about the trusting of the Archbishop, when did he make you subdeacon and deacon? Where did he do that in Econ, or did he do that in Freeburg? Where well, did we, we, consecrate you? we did it down to the Econ. We took trips down to Econ three or four times in the school year. At which he, he uh, ordained me a subdeacon and then deacon, yeah. Okay. Well, I was amazed. I, he, he calls me into his office at Econ and he said, Gregory, he, he probably used his first names. Gregory, I'm coming to Powers Lake, North Dakota again, invited by uh, the priest there for the, what did I say his name was? Oh, the, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, Fred Nelson, Father Fred Nelson. How about if I ordain you a priest then? I, I couldn't believe it. I just about fell over. He's known me less than a year, you know, personal contact, and he's willing to ordain me to the priesthood. Well, I, of course, I said, yes, that, that'd that be fine. So um, that that's happened. So I went back to Idaho, and then um, August, uh, of course, I was already saying the brevity because I was a deacon. I got on the train there, I went over a, year, a week early because you have to have a week's preparation for, you know, priesthood. And my family came over, got pictures of all these things. And so there was the usual annual pilgrimage to that place. Buses all over the place. It must have been two, maybe 3,000 people on Sunday. And then, of course, the ordination was to be on Monday. They couldn't all stay, get back to work. So uh, they could fit uh, 100 people into the chapel there at Our Lady of the Prairies which is interesting because the chapel at Econ is also called Notre Dame des Champs, which is almost exactly the same thing. And so there on Monday, August 28th, 1972, we ordained me to the priesthood. I've got pictures of that. Okay, so August 20th, 1972, then, uh, the Archbishop uh, ordained you to the priesthood. Uh, so was it the next day, then, you celebrated your first Mass? The first solemn, yes, the next day, first solemn high Mass, yes. And was the Archbishop present? Yes, he was present, yeah. Okay, and was that celebrated again in North Dakota? Oh, yeah, right there at the same place, yeah. The, the uh, same place he had ordained me a priest, the, uh, uh, yeah, the same day, the same place. All right, so you were ordained to the priesthood. How long did you stay in the United States before you went back to Europe? I went back to uh, Idaho with my family just a few days later. My mother stopped and saw the house in North Dakota, which she had been born about 60, 70 years earlier, when we went back to Idaho. Then I had to fly over to Switzerland again in October, well, September 
uh, for my final year of theology, so I, that's the way I did it. Okay, so um, we're now in uh, the fall of 72, so um, this is a, an interesting statement you just made. You said you had to finish your theology, so uh, the Archbishop obviously ordained you, um, it seems like, here early. So what did you do in that fall of 1972? Did you go back to Freiburg for your studies? Yes, I finished off the fourth year of theology at Freiburg University, yes. Okay, so that was 1972 to, to that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you still had, you guys were still living in community. Yes, we, yes, we were, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, who was now doing the Masses for the community? Would it be you, or was it this other priest that was already doing the Masses? Uh, well, since I was a priest now, I, I was doing them. Well, we did two Masses every day, uh, the other priest and, and myself, yeah. Okay, so those, um, that last year, um, how many classes did you take at the University of Freeport? Well, we had a couple classes in the morning, of theology, dogma and moral, and then one or two in the afternoon, depending on what the third subject was. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so that last year then, 72 to 73, would be your final year, finally, of your training to the priesthood. And, uh, but you would not be transferred to America until 1974, so what did you do in that final year in Europe after you graduated from the University of Freiburg with your seminary training? Well, I came back to the United States and took care of mass centers, people call chapels, if you want to call them, uh, di different parts of the country. People were calling up and saying, can you come here? Can you be? And then I got a call while I was, I think, in Texas from one of the members of the society saying, see, the Archbishop had already taken the group in Detroit into the society a year ahead of time. So that was the first mission here in America? Yes, Detroit, Detroit yes. You were still in, in, the, in Europe at this time? Yes, I was. But there was... So when you finished in 1973, uh, what was your role in Europe still? And now you were in Econ, the, the seminary, uh, the seminary training had just ended. Did you go back to Econ to live for a certain time? Uh, yes, I lived at Econ uh, for, for a semester, uh, giving classes to the English-speaking, uh, English and, and British seminarians. Uh, hmm? what, what, what were you training them in? The, the basic stuff, basic uh, theology. Hmm. Okay, so was it more just because you spoke English, or was it more because the Archbishop wanted to see if you were capable of maybe being a professor? Well, anything? I think it was both things, uh, actually. Yeah. Okay, so you stayed that extra semester then in um, Econ, eh? that would have been 73, that semester would have ended, I would presume, around Christmas time, mm -hmm. and then early 74 then, that would have been your first transfer then to the United States. Yes. And I was going across the United States, taking care of different uh, groups of people, and I got a call that a group in Detroit had to have me come up there because the priest that agreed to do it for us took off. Uh, they, I was not told why, but he uh, just took off. Okay, so you went to Detroit, and how to, long did you stay there? Uh, one semester, the into the summer of 74, at which time, Couple more Americans have been ordained, Kelly and Sanborn, though those people, and so they came back and started the society in New York, and uh, then I uh, went back to uh, teach the spring semester at Econ, the English-speaking, the basic theology stuff. Okay, so you went to Econ one more time. Yes. And then finally, after that last um, semester at Econ, you um, finally were sent to America for good, and where were you sent to America then? I asked the Archbishop it would be possible for me to start missions in California because my family and I was moving back down to San Jose and he said, well, are, are there enough people in these different California cities? And I said, yes, and on that basis, he let me do it. I, I was very surprised. He was so trusting. You know, he, he just let me do it. He just let you do it then. Uh, so that basically began your work here in America. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. so you've been doing the work ever since you're the 2022 so I would say this, um, you know, that we're going to be soon ending this conversation, this uh, little um, interview. Um, you know, what would you say, you know, what you learned uh, from our founder, Archbishop of Five, obviously Archbishop of is a giant in the church. We see the great things that he did after the Second Vatican Council, how he stood up for tradition. You know, what would be some of your, uh, your, your most, um, you know, your best recollections you can have, uh, you can say about the Archbishop then? Well, he was a very inspiring person. 
obviously. He visited me in California three times. And <clears throat> the first time <clears throat> we had a split in our group because there was a, a group that wanted to control it much more than we were. And the Archbishop met with him along with another American priest and said that this, this guy just did not, I won't mention his name, but he did not want to be under, the, he wanted to run the thing himself. So there was a split there in 74, and after a couple of years, I had enough money put together to buy uh, the, the building in Campbell, California, which became our, our West Coast headquarters, and ex expanded quite so a bit. So that be our second uh, mission then in the society, or second house in the society? Yes, uh, Campbell, California. That was in then. Okay, so again, your recollections of the Archbishop, any other special recollections you can give us, maybe in your time at Econ and Freeburg with him? Well, he was so easy to get along with, he trusted people too much. That, that what, I, what did I say? He, he thought everybody was as honest as he was, and he, he, of course he found out different, but, but it's just, it, it was hard to describe when you were in the same room with him, you felt this is something above the normal thing that you would expect, you know what I mean? He'll, I, I'm absolutely sure he will be canonized someday. And it's just when you were with him, it, it was just a different experience. And of course we had the news media there. A couple of times the local San Jose ABC channel come and visited us and took a video. We were on TV that night. Newspapers were writing to us and the whole thing. But the Archbishop's overall impression on me was he was a man totally dedicated to the service of God. He was not of this, you might say, of this earth. He was one person picked out by God to straighten things out after Vatican II. That's all, all I can say. Um, so uh, your, your recollections in the Archbishop obviously are very... Um are very positive, we can say, and um, I'm sure had a great influence on you. But you know, you've obviously now have uh, celebrated 50 years in the priesthood. And what can you tell all of us then of what your um, experience of the priesthood has been? Well, my experience is that if a priest is going to do the job correctly, he's got to have a strong spiritual life. You're going to meet all kinds of people going on. I've, I've come to the United States from almost every part of the country, and there's just so many temptations out there, and so many ways that priests can go off the rails, and some of them have, of course, and not very many. But the priest, to be a traditional priest today, must keep up a strong spiritual life. I meet every single day, no exceptions, and that's what the Archbishop taught to me, and I try to pass it on to, to the younger priests. That's what I would say. <coughs> so what would you say are your best, um, your best experiences you've had in the priesthood? What would you say are some of the things that you most cherish in the priesthood? Well, <coughs> other than ordination, I did the uh, funeral mass for my brother, my father, and my mother, and several other <coughs> funerals, of course. I suppose th those, those were the top things. And seeing people, I admitted many, many adult converts into the church. There was one time, the first mass I said at Sacramento, California, we still got a group there. I was giving instructions for months to a, a young couple, <clears throat> and I was only going up there once a month. And so on one Sunday there, third Sunday of the month, because you had to go there in the evening, this young couple, it was <coughs> her baptism, their <coughs> marriage, and her first communion all, all at the same time. So that was really something that really stuck in my mind. Yeah. <coughs> That's about, I would say, the most inspiring time I had. Okay. Well, so you've been in uh, uh, the great majority of missions here in America. And so, we, um, you know, again, as we conclude this uh, little interview, what have you seen? What have you? seen in the growth of the society here in America from the time you came here in 74, 73, 74 to, to 2022? What have you noticed in, in, um, in how the society has grown during this time? Well, there's been a very, very large growth. Every place that I go to is expanding. I, I would go <coughs> to a place that maybe two weeks later, there'd be quite a few more people. 
tremendous go. I mean, the, play, <coughs> the place here, we've got, what, 14 or so, 100 people. I've seen a great expansion because people are getting more and more disgusted and <coughs> with the, not only disgusted, but it leaves people empty. And I've had people come to our very mass centers. Say, I go to the new mass and there's, there's nothing there. So that that's a great, and it is continuing right now. More and more people are people are moving here to, to especially for the schools. People are concerned about their children <coughs> going to these <coughs> public schools are a disaster, or even the so-called Catholic schools. They're not good either. So I've seen a great progress, and it is going to continue because people can see that we've got the real Catholic faith here. Well, what would be your final words then, maybe of uh, a recommendation for any men young out there who maybe are considering the priesthood? You know, you've been a priest for 50 years now. Um, you've seen many things, um, not just in your own uh, life as a priest, but in the society. What would you have to say for any young men out there that are considering the priesthood? If they're considering the priesthood, they should first of all be in contact with priests of our society let them know what their background is and what they want. Contact the superiors at our seminary in uh, Virginia and see what they say, and then give the seminary a shot. Because he, as we were told back in the 50s in San Francisco, even if you don't continue, your, your time at the seminary is going to enrich you and it's going to make you a better person. And so I, I think we've got great possibilities of vocations in this country, which seem to be, we got a really <coughs> big entry class at, at our seminary this year, and I think it's going to continue. The grace of God is going to be there. <laughs> well, that's good then, Father. So I just wanted to give the people then an idea of your, your early years of your um, training uh, to the priesthood, and then finally your ordination, and then that those first two years or so after your ordination. So I think you know, in celebrating your 50th anniversary, obviously, we congratulate you uh, for your 50 years in service in the priesthood. Um, we congratulate you for your 50 years of faithfulness, uh, not just to the priesthood, but to the Society of St. Pius X. Uh, and we can, um, we can only thank you then uh, for your dedication um, in all the work you've done for the Society of St. Pius X. You know, I'm Father Stanich, and I've had Father Post 15 years with me, so I've had um, a great chance of knowing our first priest uh, of the Society of St. Pius X. So I've learned maybe a little of the spirit of the Archbishop uh, by living with you for these uh, 15 years or so. And I think uh, it's been a, uh, a little of a learning experience for me to be, to be with someone who was there at the beginning with our founder, so again, we congratulate you uh, here today uh, in celebrating your 50th anniversary, and we can only wish for many more years in the priesthood to you. We, we hope you can continue to do a little apostolate here in America, and uh, maybe be like your typical good, good priest who just die doing your work. Yes, I hope so. If I die going somewhere to say Mass, or I hope I don't die during Mass, but, but I'll die exactly where and when the Lord wants me, and that's fine with me. Okay. Well, thanks for the interview, Father. Again, we congratulate you and your priesthood, your 50 years of the priesthood, and um, we pray that in God will look with great mercy upon all the work you've done and all the compassion you've shown on people through the years. And as I can only say, I hope it can continue for a few more years so that... Yes. The, the young people can see someone who was, uh, had a great um, a personal relationship with our founder, Archbishop of Fab, oh. and maybe they can be inspired to, to want to, to, to enter into the priesthood and, and continue that work of the Archbishop and continue the work of the older generation of priests who brought uh, tradition here to America. So thank you for the interview today. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, we wish the best for you and uh, oh. your years to come. Good, thank you, Father. Same to you. Okay.